welcome to Marshmallow Reads. I'm Marcy, and today I'm finally getting around to telling you all of the wonderful books I read in March. Last month, I really leaned into my cottage witch aesthetic, and it paid off with some fantastic reads. Can't wait to tell you about them. Doing something a little bit different today, I have, instead of doing it in like chronological order, I have split up the eight-ish books that I read into a few different categories. The first one is romance. So I believe this contains three books, one that's just like a straight contemporary romance, and then a couple that are more like fantasy focused, but with romance elements. And to start us off, this is Sweet Hand by N.G. Pelletier. This is the first of the Island Bites trilogy. We are following Charisse, who is a renowned pastry chef who has sworn off dating any men from the music industry because of bad past experiences. And her younger sister is getting married soon and she has been named Maid of Honor. Fantastic. Except the groom has named this guy Kieran as his best man. And Charisse and Kieran, ever since school, they have never got along. They're just always bickering and bantering. Not always in a fun way, so uh, not ideal. Because even though they can't stand being in the same room as each other, they're going to have to figure something out because they're both in charge of a bunch of wedding planning tasks like decorations, planning baked goods, because obviously Charisse is going to make her sister some bomb ass sweets. I really liked this book. I love that it was set in Trinidad and just like the island life is so vibrant. It just jumps off the page, including in describing the characters outfits and styles. They are just like, Oh, I'm, I'm jealous. I didn't even get to like see them, but like the way all the outfits were described just made me want all of them. I loved the dual POV of Charisse and Kieran. They clearly are imperfect human beings. Who's perfect? You know, no one is, but they have obvious chemistry together and that was super cute and enjoyable to read. Like. Over the course of the story, their banter evolves from like legit antagonistic arguments into more cute couple banter and I love that. And there were some pretty good spicy scenes. Honestly, I would have preferred the entire story to end on one instead of like just a cute wedding scene. But that's just me personally. I gave this one a four out of five stars. If you're into contemporary romance, absolutely check this one out. Next up is a new favorite of mine. This is A Far Wilder Magic by Alison Saft. I obtained this ebook through NetGalley. Thank you very much. Um, but unexpectedly, it gave me a lot of problems like downloading the actual book onto my phone, like through the NetGalley app. It just wouldn't download for whatever reason. So I ended up downloading the DRM version to my desktop, and then I had to download an Adobe drm capable reader it was a lot and for basically any other book i would have just given up at that point but i was not giving up on this one like i i had barely even started reading it or no it was before i started reading it i just i knew from the cover from the description i needed to read this one and i'm so happy i persevered because it was so worth it so this one has a main focus on like the fantasy story, but with some pretty heavy romance elements that I was very much into. Our first character is Margaret. She is 17 years old and has been left home alone by her mother to take care of the house, to like prepare it for winter, do a bunch of chores and stuff. And her mother has been away for a few months now, away on this alchemy research trip. And she claims that as soon as I get what I need for my research, we'll be a family again. That is not what I call a good work-life balance, my dear. So it's clear that Evelyn and Margaret have a strained relationship and Margaret is absolutely neglected. Yeah, she's 17. Yeah, she's pretty self-sufficient, but she shouldn't be left on her own for months at a time. Like, you don't do that to a kid. Anyway, the other character we have is Wes, who is a similar age, I probably like maybe a couple years older than Margaret. And he is a fantasy Irishman who is flunked out of three previous alchemy internships or apprenticeships. And he's going to try to ask Evelyn to 
give him his last chance to become an alchemist. His previous attempts ended because of an undiagnosed learning disability and um, being perceived as uh, having limitations by his teachers. So um, basically it was just racism. He's an immigrant, so he clearly can't be smart enough to do alchemy, that kind of stuff. For example, once he fails a single written exam, he can see the vindication in his instructor's eyes like they've been waiting for him to confirm their suspicions. Yeah. And now he's come all the way from the big city to beg Evelyn for his last chance. This story gave me strong Full Metal Alchemist vibes. Makes sense, alchemy, but not every alchemy story feels Full Metal Alchemisty to me, but this one did. And it's probably why I ended up loving it so much. It is pretty similar, but it's less military focused, more small town racism. It seems to be set in the early 1900s New England, with Wes being fantasy Irishman and Maggie being fantasy Jewish, both very much being outsiders in this community. And then there's the Hala, this very powerful and dangerous and scary fox demon that every year terrorizes the countryside. And every year they try, the townspeople try to do this hunt where a, a marksman and an alchemist team up to try to kill the Hala to, you know, save the town and stuff. But this hasn't been done in a long, long time because the Hala is super, super powerful. It is a demigod. But Wes and Maggie eventually decide to team up and try to do this thing. Maybe they can actually kill it. The writing was so good. It was like a dark fairy tale sort of thing. And like, I love me some good wind rustling leaves in the darkness of the woods. Like, and in general, I am such a slut for spooky magical woods. If your book's got it, I'm probably gonna like it. Um, especially, uh, this reminds me of the Jasmine Throne that had a spooky magical woods and it was amazing. Oh, there is so much more I want to say about this book, so I'll, I'll try to <laughs> keep it short. Here's some bullet points. There is a lot of tension about using alchemy and the dangers of it, especially the dangers that would come with trying to make a philosopher's stone and why that might be a really bad idea. In this world, racism is still a thing. It's like a major plot of the story, but being gay is a-okay. And this was funny because um, Wes has a, either bisexual or lesbian, a sapphic sister who would consistently snipe his dates away from him. And I thought that was hilarious. And having the story set in fantasy New England, like with, you know, same vibes, but like different names and stuff, that allowed me to feel more okay with this just straight up acceptance of queer folk that is fantastic. That part felt more like vintage feel, not vintage values, which I absolutely love. But I also understood keeping in the racism. It's an actual part of the main story and the main conflicts, so it made sense leaving it in. And then on Maggie's side, this is absolutely a story about gaining the strength to finally face your emotionally abusive parent and no longer feeling invisible. And to top it all off, we have an absolutely lovely romance with Wes and Maggie. Like maybe consider reading this one if you're a Jane Austen fan. Like there isn't like a lot of um, uh, explicit moments, but the, the pining, the pining, both of them pining for each other and it's wonderful. And then like at, at one point they have like a running hug and <laughs> it was it was swoon worthy. Like, oh, maybe also Bridgerton. I, I've only seen like videos about it, but I have a feeling if you like that sort of romance stories, you'll probably like this one as well. This one was a very obvious five out of five stars for me. As soon as I see it in physical copy, I'm going to snatch it up so fast. Oh my God, I can't wait to read it again. And next we have another fantasy focused YA novel with romance elements in A Psalm of Storms and Silence by Rosanna Brown. This completes the duology of A Song of Wraiths and Ruin, a YA fantasy series based on the myths of Western and Northern Africa. From Goodreads, Karina lost everything after a violent coup left her without her kingdom or her throne. 
Now, the most wanted person in Sanande, her only hope of reclaiming what is rightfully hers lies in a divine power hidden in a long lost city of her ancestors. I definitely enjoyed this one more than the first one. I think the first book is obviously necessary as a, um, a setup of the world, the characters, and the powers that be in that world, and I think that did a good job of doing that. But now getting to dive deeper into these ancient histories and um, mystical beings, that was so much more fun for me. <laughs> like, I loved seeing all the different element aligned Zoenji using their magic. And even though the elements depicted here are not uncommon in media, like Avatar The Last Center, Airbender and stuff like that, the specific depictions of these elements felt unique and fresh. And then our romantic couple, Malik and Karina, are legit cute. Like, I, I was rooting for them. I wish they were able to spend more physical time together. Like, they, they did have the um, vision dream visits together, but I wish they had more, like, literal time together. But, eh, I'll take what I can get. Oh, and I was both glad and relieved to see Karina actually doing something for her people to improve their lives, especially uh, with the, the start to mending the injustices done to Malik's people. Like, that was huge for me. Like, girl, you have the power to do something, do it. <laughs> yeah, I would not mind seeing more of this world, either with the same characters, with some of the side characters that we didn't get to see too much of, or with completely new characters. Like, I'm up for so many things. Just give me more of this, please. I give this one a four out of five stars. Check it out if you like YA fantasies. Next up is a category with only one book, but I loved it very much, and I would like to read more in this type of category. Uh, this is Wholesome Fantasy, and the one book I read in it is The Tea Dragon Society by Kay O'Neill. Uh, Kay both wrote and illustrated this book. Fantastic job. One day, Greta discovers a lost tea dragon, and after returning the cute little thing, the tea shop owners offer to teach her the ways of the tea dragon society as a reward. You see, the tea made from these tea dragons is like top tier amazing, but it does take a lot of work and effort and love to cultivate it. This may be my ideal aesthetic in graphic novel form. Like I was so in love with this art style and I believe there's two more books in this series. So I'm absolutely gonna have to read those like today, tomorrow, this week, very soon. Greta is just so lovely and I admire her fondness for keeping old traditions alive. She is the daughter of a blacksmith and now is taking up tea dragon caring. And the tea dragon that they give her brick <laughs> so cute like all of the tea dragons are cute and oh my god the two tea shop owners they're two older men um who are in a relationship uh hesekiel and hezekiel uh hezekiel and eric they once were adventurers i guess one is more like sword fighting another more like a sorcerer type of stuff and when they were fighting side by side they would never leave each other no matter what happens, like, oh, it's just, it was so beautiful and heartwarming. They, they are super supportive of each other and I love that. This group of folks also takes care of this girl, Minette, who is learning how to find herself now that she no longer has her future seeing abilities and is also dealing with some memory loss because of it. I'm glad that she has found people to care for her and help her through it. Like, like I said, it's all just so wholesome and heartwarming. I am for sure adding this to my physical copy wish list. Like, I, I cannot wait to move out of here, settle down wherever we go, and start building my library. I don't think it's ever going to be a huge one, but it's at least going to be my little cozy corner of, you know, wherever we end up living. If it wasn't clear, I gave this one a 5 out of 5 stars because it's just mwah, perfect. Couldn't ask for anything more. The next category I have called Going to School While Black. This is one, well, both of them are memoirs, but one is memoir mixed with magical realism. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But both of these follow two 
black women reflecting on their time in uh, high school and college and uh, all the different and uh, concerning ways that their lives were made just a little bit more miserable by being black surrounded by a bunch of white kids. Yeah. Let's start with The Chosen One by Echo Brown. This is a YA novel that, like I said, combines memoir and magical realism to discuss the author's disappointments and triumphs as a black first-generation college student during her first year. Mm, what a great opening line. You are the guardian of the timelines, a chosen one. This is the call. At first, I was a little unsure about the whole chosen one thing. It usually isn't my jam, but Later, the book explains that Echo is just one of multiple chosen ones because that's just way too much power and responsibility to put on a single person. Like, mm -mm. there's no way a single person can heal all the timelines. It's a coordinated effort across time and space, and I can absolutely get behind that idea. As I expected, there are definitely things in here that I related to a lot. <laughs> like the quote, I felt ugly in high school but I feel like Igor on campus among these fairy tale white people and their socially accepted beauty. Ah, uh, yep, mm-hmm, uh-huh, yep. Mm, very much felt that at my <laughs> private, small liberal arts college <laughs> in Vermont. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> in this one. What's the point of all that brilliance if you can't transmit anything to others? Because, yeah, bored lecture professors who don't care enough to make their students actually learn something and make sure that they're, you know, getting something out of the class. Like, yes, just because you are a world-renowned scientist, professor, expert, whatever, does not make you a good teacher. Hopefully, the two overlap, but not always. Ugh. Oh, no. Not the slave and master role play in the cafeteria to advocate for U.S. reparations. I don't know if that's the best uh, route to take, guys. <laughs> like, this kind of shit reminds me of this one guy who lived in my dorm who had a Confederate flag spittoon. For reasons. This dude was from, like, upstate New York. Like, what are you doing? Ah, yes. And the hypocrisy of allowing hateful speakers on campus, like Charles Murray, and speakers that actively harm the marginalized students, and yet the students claim that they are upholding diversity in their institutions and supportive of their diverse students. Like, no, fuck free speech. You should be protecting your students who pay way too much fucking money to be harassed at this school. Not okay. Stop doing this. Please and thank you. This is technically spoilers. I don't care. I'm so happy that Echo got a happy ending. Like, get it, girl. Wonderful. I give this one a five out of five stars. Next up is Admissions, a memoir of surviving boarding school by Kendra James. Yep, the book is just as the title says. I think this would be a great read for anyone who is interested in hearing real stories from real people. Like, if you like memoirs, you're probably gonna like this one. But especially if you have any familiarity with <laughs> these types of environments, like being the only one in the room, fill in the blank on what that only one is, you know, in this case, black. <laughs> and just like the last one, there are a lot of things in here that very much resonated with me. Like, oh my god, yes. P parents, respectability politics. Especially if you are an immigrant and a minority. <laughs> like her parents vocally not liking rap or ghetto music and assuming that whoever was singing needed to pull up their pants. <clears throat> Like, I'm not here to roast my parents, but just like a little bit, you know? Oh, Lord. Kendra's 
um, before she went to boarding school, she had her freshman year at a public high school that sounds very similar to the one I went to. A diverse student population and she had a diverse friend group. But because she was pushed into high or the highest level classes, she rarely ever interacted with those diverse classrooms. Oh my gosh. And then Kendra talks about how her school Taft would have only one good dance a year because it was when they bust all of the Black and Latinx students from various schools into a single place and like played good music. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like that's pretty funny. <laughs> it, but so sad that they were only able to have that sort of community and and bond building activities and stuff like once a year like <laughs> that sucks <sighs> but yeah i enjoyed how in depth she went into ex her experience and all of the little things that she didn't notice right away but y years later when she's uh, working at a job that is basically <sighs> helping underrepresented students get into the schools like taft and being in that position as an adult is forcing her to realize some stuff about her experiences and how very fucked up they were in uh, in some cases so good read uh i ended up giving this one a four out of five stars it could also have been a five like i don't know it it was it was really good and the last category is oof life as a woman the last two books absolutely could have gone in this category but i just decided to split them up a little bit. First up is a non-fiction book. This is Invisible Women, a Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Carolyn Criado Perez. I had heard about this one for a little while and I'm finally getting around to it and I'm happy I did. One thing to note is that this book, this study, is very binary, like gender binary. And I think it's mostly due to the type of data that has been collected for the majority of our written history. Like, I'm not sure of the exact details, but I doubt the entities that be have been collecting data on genders outside of man and woman. So just keep that in mind. And even though it is constricted to the gender binary, I think it was still an interesting read and worth your time. Worth my time, at least. <laughs> One topic I'm glad of seeing talked about more, including in this book, is Women's labor. So much of women's work is unpaid. And uh, this includes cleaning, cooking, child rearing, taking care of elders, and so much more. And if she works, she is doing all of that work on top of a full day's work. Thankfully, I, I chose a partner that, that is very conscious about that. And we split things pretty equally, although less so now that my back is busted, but hopefully that improves soon. But anyway, this disproportionate share of the work being put on women leads to issues all over the place, like how mothers are at a distinct disadvantage in tenure track academia. I can tell you, especially a lot of the older women in the departments I see don't have children. Or if they did, they did it before their life in academia. And there's reasons why. Like, it's really, really hard to have an appropriate work-life balance when you are on the intense deadline of being tenure track. Like you only have five or whatever years to get all of the research and data needed to prove to the university that you are worth keeping for life. And I can't imagine how stressful that is. No, thank you. And then there's also the issue with, you know, finding fully paid or any amount paid maternity leave and also paternity leave, like everyone who has a new kid should be getting, in my opinion, at least one full year paid. It just that That's just the right thing to do. Like, please, US, why are you so dumb? I mean, I know why, but like still. And then there's, you know, bias in hiring and life in the workplace. Like something benign that this book talks about is there is a reason why in general women are always so freaking cold in the office and this is because way back when when they were trying to find the optimal temperature for you know to keep these offices at they were looking at the average temperature of 40 year old men doing an average amount of office work 
well, turns out this ideal temperature is actually lower than what is optimal for women doing the same amount of office work. Yeah, that, that, this makes sense. This is why I always have a blanket on my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more thing that I wanted to mention is how most equipment is designed around the male body, like uh, bricks that are too big to be held one handed in the average female hand. Same goes for phones, uh, stuff like wrenches, uh, Air Force pilot vests, like the, the, the vests were uh, best suited for hairy, sturdy chests without titties. <laughs> And um, also ill-fitting uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Like loose PPE can get stuck or caught in machinery that can <laughs> absolutely lead to bodily harm or even death. You know, fun stuff to talk about with the girlies. This one was a four out of five stars read for me. Like overall, a great read made me feel all sorts of frustrated. And the last book I'm going to talk about for the month of March is The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. Ah, yes, investing in insane surveillance and AI judgment instead of, you know, mental health or other support from others. <sighs> A completely believable allocation of government funds. <laughs> this is a pretty new release that takes a dystopian view at our potential future where bad mothers get sent to the school for good mothers. And yes, there is also a school for good fathers, <laughs> but for some reason, that school seems to have way fewer enrollees. I wonder why that is. But yes, our, our main mother that we're following, Frida Liu, she had one immensely bad day. On top of being a working mother, she is also soloing 50% of parenting because shortly after birth, she found out that uh, her fuckboy husband had been cheating on her with a much younger white woman. Uh, Frida comes from a Chinese immigrant family and a lot of pressure had been put on her to have the perfect life, but clearly that didn't work out so much. And all of this stress has left her at her absolute wit's end when one day, she had to leave her 18 month old daughter home alone to run to the office to grab some important papers. And you know, just the whole thing spiraled out of control. She ended up being gone for like two and a half hours. And during this time, some neighbor called the cops on her and dragged her into this whole mess. Jesus, this is one sharp look into how mothers today, like right now, are expected to always be 100% perfect, even when the definition of perfect mother is ever shifting. And this school that Frida is forced into uh, for an entire year, and she has to make it through this hellscape in order to ever see her daughter again, because otherwise she will be banned from seeing her until she turns 18 when the daughter is allowed to ask for that relationship back. It, it's so fucked. <sighs> in the school. It, it makes it makes no sense. It's complete farce. The school says that it can measure good motherhood in terms of the exact correct length of a hug, or the pitch of your mother speak, or proper intensity of eye contact. And like, they track all this data by using some very uh, lifelike dolls that I like they I, these dolls absolutely have some level of consciousness. It's it's kind of creepy. I feel bad for them. <laughs> they're just stuck in a closet when they're not being used. And over the course of the year, the mothers must demonstrate that they're improving in their motherly skills by performing exams using these dolls. Uh, these dolls that they're practicing as their real life children. And I liked that part. I liked the the bonds and relationships formed over time between the mothers especially Frida and her fake daughter doll. Uh, I, I wish more time had been spent on that, but mm, oh well. And I will say that these exams and the lessons definitely started to get <laughs> too repetitive for me. Uh, like you're, you're seeing the same kinds of interactions between the mothers and their dolls and also between the mothers and the other mothers. And like I said, I just wish that the book had instead spent more time on the relationships rather than showing the same things over and over again. Like I 
I didn't really care about the school curriculum. It, like, eh. And besides the horror and anxiety of this whole situation, I'm not sure what else this book has to say. I don't care for stories that simply describe a dystopia and, and has its characters do nothing about it. And I understand if you, one is really absolutely powerless in the, this type of world, but like, even if your struggle is in vain, I want to see you try. It was a pretty interesting idea, but I wish it had gone in a different direction than it did. I ended up giving this one a three out of five stars. Okay, that was fun. I had a great reading month uh, so far. April is also looking really good, although it's definitely more of a sci-fi month, and I can't wait to tell you more about that. And before you go, go ahead and click that like button for me and double check to see if you are subscribed or not. If you're not, please consider subscribing to my cozy little channel here. I hope you all have an amazing week. Do something nice for yourself, like buying a reduced price Easter candy and do something nice for others, like hiding a bunch of little chocolates around the house for them to find just because. And with that, I will see you in the next one. Bye. I legit can't believe how cute my hair looks right now. I did it by myself in like 15 minutes, like nuts.